we have a special guest with us uh, today on the Amy Oliver Show uh, with, a, with some big ideas to address some of the big problems we face in education. Uh, he's a local man, and uh, welcome John Conlon from MD Education Plantation. Glad to have you with us. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about why uh, you are uh, interested and engaged in the issue of education reform. Sure. Uh, in my real life, I'm a management consultant. I work a lot with beer wholesalers, beer, wine, spirits people. And in the course of my work, I've been in some of the toughest neighborhoods in this country. And we would always go early to these territories. I'd like to go out and see what the territory's like, go visit some retailers, get a feel for distances and things. And I'd see the same thing regardless of where I was in the country. Little four and five year old kids playing outside like most four and five year old kids do. But as they got older and older, they just had a harder and harder look in their eyes. Until their time about maybe nine or 10 years old, they had a look in their eyes that no kid in this country should have. And their one chance, their only chance to get out of the madness that they were born into uh, is a chance at a decent education. And uh, we are failing them. Uh, the inner city schools are, are a disgrace. And then when you dig in, you find out that, well, this is not just a problem in the inner cities. Uh, although the poorer you are, the worse it is. But there's plenty of middle class kids that are getting terrible educations too. And to, to be blunt about it, Ben, it just pissed me off and I decided to do something about it. I think a lot of people, I mean, there's been a lot of attention brought to the, the serious problems in the inner city education. But as you, and, and we know there's a lot of money spent per student on inner city schools. <laughs> No, it's it, being spent to ill effect. It, exactly. It, it's crazy. I, I was just in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, trying to do some lobbying last week on, on this issue. And, and you know, the Washington, D.C. school district uh, spends over $30,000 per pupil per, per year for the worst public education system in the country, the lowest graduation rates. If you gave those parents that $30,000, they could send their kids to a pretty darn good private school and you'd be guaranteed they'd get a heck of a lot better education. Or even a significant portion of thirty thousand dollars. Exactly, so people will be able to do a lot better. But as you mentioned, uh, you know the awareness is there. I think more for the problems and the shortcomings in inner city schools and urban education. Uh, but here in Colorado and all over the country, um, you know some some schools in the suburbs are doing a good job, but a lot are not. And I think uh, we're not getting really the attention brought to that as much as well. But you, you see that as a real shortcoming too. Oh, oh, without a doubt, there's there's a lot of parents out there. If you if you think your you know son or daughter is doing okay because they're bringing home B's or C's in school, you might be sadly mistaken. And sadly, a, a lot of middle class kids are never going to reach the economic success of their parents in large part because of the lousy education that they got. And, and, and when we're talking about education, we're talking about um, a system that uh, really was created probably you know hundred years ago. Uh, the sort of the factory model that we see, you know, uh, we're putting 20, 30 kids in a box in the classroom and the idea was all kids we can, uh, we assumed the assumption was all kids would learn at the same rate, we'd, we would uh, push them through the system and we would have enough uh, factory workers and we have enough professional workers and, and so forth, but we're getting into a, a new century, a new economy, and we're really just falling short of, of those expectations. Oh, oh, without a doubt. Well, and you know, going into my my business background, uh, you know, management thinking has evolved quite a bit from the '40s and '30s. People are not managed the same way, for good reason. Uh, it didn't work very well, and I think the same thing needs to be done with with uh, the K through 12 public education system. And our, our goal is is quite simple. This money's being spent on these children anyhow. In in, in a very literal sense, it's their money anyhow. Why don't we allow them and their parents decide where it's spent uh, in any state approved school? It's a simple thing, it won't change tax rates, it won't raise taxes, it doesn't do, has no impact on anything. Instead of having some faceless bureaucrats deciding where and how this money's spent, let's let the parents choose. So I assume then this is where we get the name of your group and the education plantation. Uh, the idea here is to take the shackles off as it were and put the power in the hands of families, is that a fair way to describe it? it exactly, I, I, I chose that that name because I think it's very descriptive. One, it's offensive, but it's offensive what's being done to the children of this country. Uh, and, if, if, and if you look at the arguments against freedom and choice, true freedom and choice across the board, all the arguments against it really boil down to one issue, one point. 
We can't allow them to have their freedom because if we do, they might run off the plantation. Okay, that is the definition of slavery. This, our goal is to unchain the children. It's obscene. Well, for those of us who've been involved in the education reform debates for any length of time, uh, you know, we're aware that there are some pretty powerful entrenched interests out there defending the, the current system, defending the status quo. And the attitude you tend to get is, uh, parents, parents, they don't really know. Uh, parents aren't well informed. Let leave it. Let's leave this to the experts. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, I'm, I'm I, you know, we, we want to change the entire paradigm. Right now, it's a top-down kind of expert-driven. You know, we know what's best for you paradigm. Uh, I think if you look around the the world, every product, every good, every service out there since the beginning of mankind has been improved through competition and freedom. There's no reason that won't work in education. And to say that parents, you know, aren't smart enough to, to you know, choose a good school for their kids, I think is an insult to parents. They, they somehow can, you know, go get mortgages, hold, hold jobs, they can live their lives. You know, how, you, how your child is raised is one of the most profound rights that I think a parent has. And I think we should allow parents to exercise that right more fully. Yeah, and here in Colorado, we've had we have a fairly long history of public school choice and uh, open enrollment. Parents can opt, take their kids out um, from a school within the district to another school, either in the same district or outside the district. We have charter schools, so we have some element of choice. Uh, but isn't isn't the idea or part of the problem that well, maybe we've never really entrusted parents with this responsibility and, and that. If we entrust parents with this responsibility and give them the kind of widespread choice you're talking about, you're really confident that they could step up to the plate. Well, of course. I mean, nationwide, you know, we spend about eleven thousand five hundred per per student per per year on education. My attitude is, let's put that money, that cold hard cash, in parents' hands, uh, and they they can't spend it on the rent, they can't spend it on their car payment, they can spend it on the education of their child in state-approved schools. That will totally change the paradigm, and and. Parents, uh, I don't know any parent uh, who doesn't want a better life for their kids. And, and a lot of these, whether it's you know open enrollment like Colorado has, charter schools and whatnot, those work pretty well, or they work well, you know, if your parent is really dedicated, motivated, and has the resource. If you're some single mom living in five points, guess what? That open enrollment probably doesn't mean a darn thing to you. Right, I mean, until we entrust parents with that, that responsibility until we say, you know, believe they can actually do it and step up and make those decisions for kids that we entrust them in so many other areas from, uh, you know, what, what their kids should eat, what their kind of doctor they should go to and so on. Uh, we're not really sure, you know, how that would, how that would turn out unless we give them that same responsibility in education. And certainly we, we can't do much worse, especially in the inner cities with, with, with the results we're getting. We got about a minute before the break. Talk a little bit then about how you see your, your main solution, the education freedom accounts? We call them education freedom accounts. There's other places to call them education you know, savings accounts. I, I don't care if you call them FRED. We just basically say, the money's being spent on these children anyhow. Let's let the parents decide where it's spent by where they choose to send their children to school at any state approved school. And what this will do, there'll be an explosion of schools, new public schools. Instead of having one public school to go to, you might have 10 public schools you could go to. They're all public, they've all been approved by the state. Uh, and then we let the wonders of freedom and competition take over. Things that work will grow and expand, things that don't will, will change, will be modified. Uh, it works in billions and billions of instances and in every product out there. It will work in education too. There's no reason it won't. Well, when we come back, we'll continue to explore this idea of education freedom accounts with John Conlon from M Education Plantation. But right now, it's time for the uh, bottom of the hour news break from the News Talk 1310 KFKA 24 hour news and weather center. We'll come back to the Amy Oliver Show on News Talk 1310 KFKA. If you're just tuning in at 10.30, probably not used to hearing me. This is Ben DeGrove from the Independence Institute, filling in for this half hour from 10.15 to 10.45 for Amy, discussing K-12 education issues. We got shifted back a little bit because of the President's uh, press conference. Uh, but we have one more segment with our guest, John Conlon. He's the founder and CEO of End the Education Plantation. And as I learned today, he's a Colorado native, and he's actually uh, our Northern Colorado listeners will probably be glad to know he's a Weld County native. Am I right about that? You're right, from a good little cell boy. So, uh, somebody 
with uh, grassroots here, here in Colorado with a grassroots idea, uh, a big idea that we talked about in, in the first segment to uh, lead us towards real competition in education by giving, essentially giving the money that we spend on education to parents in the form of what we call education freedom accounts. Now, we, we spend a lot of time criticizing the current education system, and there's a lot of justification in doing that. But uh, you don't see that it's necessarily the fault of uh, existing teachers or administrators or the people who are practicing doing the hard work in the trenches, do you? No, not at all. In, 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 I'm a management consultant. I, I help reorganize businesses. I help build new systems. Sometimes they're people-based, sometimes they're process-based. So I, I understand system analysis. And if you analyze the system, you, you analyze K-12 through education, say, okay, it's, it's clearly not working. That's, that's universally accepted. What's wrong? We, you, you look at the teachers. It's not the teachers. This country is filled with dedicated, hardworking, loving teachers, administrators, parapros, volunteers across the board. It is not those folks. Uh, you look at funding. We are, spend more per pupil than all of them, the one country in the entire world. It's not funding. It's a system problem. And the only way to change a system problem is to change the system. Putting more money into a flawed system will not, will not help. Working harder won't help. A lot of teachers understand that. They pound their head against the wall trying to get change, trying to get change. Oftentimes they finally give up. You can't blame them. But they are certainly not the problem. They are the solution. But at the same time, the groups who uh, represent teachers, the groups who represent school boards and administrators, the unions, the, uh, the teachers association, the school board association, all these groups, are the powerful forces protecting the status quo as it is. And when we see some reforms happening at the state level, uh, some of the bigger ones of late, bringing more school choice to allow parents to take kids out of the public school system, like vouchers in, in Louisiana, Indiana, and, and in other places as well, to create even these modest programs are getting staunch, staunch resistance from these groups. So how do we get, how do we get from where we are to this grand idea you have of, of, of education freedom accounts. I, I, I think it, it fundamentally goes back to a statement you just made of people taking things out, people taking students out of the public education system, this charter schools and whatnot. My thinking is change the paradigm. We need to change the paradigm of what is a public school, okay? So nothing I'm saying will take anyone out of the public school system. It totally just changes um, the definition of public schools. And as far as, you know, the teachers' unions, I've worked with pl plenty of unions in my, in my business background. Unions are, are resistant to change. They, that's just the nature of the beast. But, you know, you, you, can, you can have arguments about whether the, the teachers' unions are, are part of the solution. You can debate that. But, you know, the teachers' unions aren't the reason most fourth and eighth graders aren't proficient in reading or in math. Uh, they're not the reason that, you know, the ACT reports that 75% of incoming college freshmen aren't prepared for college. Or SAT reports that, you know, high school reading levels are at the lowest they've been in 40 years. I know there's a lot of ingrained people. I know change is, is difficult for people to accept. I deal with change all the time in my professional environment. But uh, it is a moral outrage what is happening to these people, and they can either decide to be on the, the side of, of the plantation owners, those who are going to fight to keep the children slaves, or they can be on the, the, the abolitionist side who want to free the slaves. And I know which side's going to win, and it's going to be mine. So if we went to a system like, like the education freedom accounts, where the money goes into the, essentially the hands of the parents, and the parents are directing, uh, and they can spend that money in the public school, essentially, anywhere they want to create this system of competition. Uh, so we're building up a system of where parents are realizing the power they have and the demand. Is the, do you really think there's enough good supply of uh, quality uh, instruction in that? Would, would this also require changing, for example, the laws we, by which we license teachers, or would we be able to bring more good teachers in the system by bypassing those laws and creating more freedom there as well? Well, that's the, that's the wonderful thing of, of freedom. There's, there's 50 different states. They'll all address this, this issue uh, differently. Uh, you know, I, I believe in, in letting freedom ring. I mean, I, th I think my proposal would be great for teachers because I think instead of having, like I said, one public school out there, you might have 10. That This will cause an explosion of public schools. They're all going to need instructors. The best teachers are going to have multiple, multiple job offers. So I think, I think it will ch 
uh, be an explosion for those people and whether you know whether the regulatory nature changes of, of, of licensing and whatnot that's to the states I, I would think that it probably will drive that it'll be different in California than it might be in Texas or Colorado but once that process starts uh, it turns into a virtuous circle where good things lead to more good things well here's a big question because I think a lot of the people tied into the existing paradigm are used to the debates about school accountability and quality and how do we get the best results and they're pretty accustomed to bringing mechanisms in from the top down uh, you know school report cards or you know uh, improvement plans and things they're all regulated from the state or level or higher and they're going to say well given a system like the one you how, like the one you propose how do we ensure quality or accountability well somehow the states are doing it now let the, let's just you know, so at worst case, they can copy what, what they're doing now. I would hope that they would expand that a little bit. But, you know, there's, there's plenty of teachers out there who, who uh, complain about the administration and it's causing them problems. Under my uh, paradigm, why don't get 20 of those teachers or 100 of those teachers and they form a co-op and they start their own school and let, let them teach the children. And, and the, the results speak for themselves. I mean, math is math, science is science, reading is reading. Those things really aren't that difficult to, to test for. Um, and like I said, some, somehow the states are doing it now. I don't, I don't see this as a, a significant issue, to tell you the truth. And you see, you don't see that the, the great lever for changing this, bringing us education freedom accounts, the lever is not going to your local, local school board and demanding change. You don't see the lever is going to the state legislature and or the governor and trying to get state legislation passed. You have a different idea about how to get to education freedom accounts. Talk a little bit about that. Exactly. The, my organization wants to has a, a goal of passage. Federal legislation has one simple goal. Any state that accepts federal educational dollars, and that's about 9% on average around the country, uh, if they want those dollars, they have to offer education freedom accounts uh, equal to 95%, at least 95% of what's uh, per pupil spending in that school or district, and that will be uh, directed by the, by the parents. If the states do not want the federal education dollars, they don't have to change a darn thing. If parents are happy with the public schools that their kid's going to, they will send their child to that school. Nothing will change for them. If they're unhappy, there will be other opportunities that will, that will pop up that they can go there. So um, let's hone in for a minute. Somebody listening here might be a listener from Greeley or rural Weld County and say this education freedom account concept is in effect and for argument's sake uh, Colorado spends about ten thousand dollars per student so if I'm a parent in Weld County or in Larimer County and uh, this is in effect I get ninety five hundred dollars and I can spend the money on what and what are the limitations how could I spend that money? Well since since the states haven't determined what what the boundaries are uh, that wouldn't be determined but it would be at any uh, state approved school e each state will have to, you know, you, there has to be some regulatory structure in, involved. Uh, my professional life, I'm, you know, I experienced the beverage alcohol industry. It's a state regulated industry. I understand that you can have very, very good state regulation and still have incredible competition. We can bring the same paradigm, the same model to K through 12 education. And in fact, we could even expand it. I say K, but it could be early childhood education this money could be spent on because a lot of the solutions start there too. All right, so John Conlon, founder and CEO of End the Education Plantation. People are listening and out there may be saying, I really like this idea of putting freedom and competition in the education system, and I want to be a part of your group or your movement. Uh, what do I do next? Well, th there's, there's two things you can do. First, send us a check. I mean, bottom line, we, we need your money. This is about as grassroots as you can get. You're, you're hearing the entire organization. Uh, I'm, I'm one guy from flyover country who just got fed up, fed up with it. Uh, call it my Rosa Parks moment or whatever. So we want your money. We also want you to sign up for our newsletter because we're soon going to turn this to the moral crusade that it is, and we want you to be there. Uh, and, to, and your website, people can find more information. The website is uh, www.andtheeducationplantation.org. But, but I'd like to end, everyone out there listening to this, think of a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. He says, he who passes, passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetrate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. What is happening to our kids is evil. We need your help. John Conlon, founder and CEO of End the Education Plantation. Uh, check out endtheeducationplantation.org. 
it's been a great conversation and uh, I hopefully someday and soon we will see the kind of system that you envision you as Bowser. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. We plan on winning this battle. So this is Ben DeGroe signing off. Amy Oliver will be back to finish the show after the break. Thanks for listening here on News Talk 1310 KFKA.